Good morning, Paul Weston. Thank you very much for agreeing to speak to me this morning. Um, I want to ask you some questions about uh, your activity in politics and about the British Freedom Party, which I believe is the party that you lead. That's right. Um, first of all, can you tell me why you got involved in politics? Uh, I have been involved in politics uh, for a long time, uh, not necessarily on the British Freedom side of it, but we became very aware, I became very aware a few years ago, that nobody, no political party was representing what needs to be represented now. Which is what? Well, I think the one thing that people do not talk about is the Islamic question in this country now. They don't talk about mass immigration. They don't talk about countering this relentless wave of PC propaganda. They don't talk about the crime levels. They don't talk about doing something to sort out the educational system in this but country. Surely, I mean, the other parties are addressing these issues, aren't they? I mean, why, why did you decide to join British Freedom, which is a small new party, when you could have been much more effective by, I don't know, joining UKIP or, or the Conservatives? Well, I joined UKIP. I mean, I, I actually stood for election with UKIP. And the only reason I did so is because they had, uh, at the time, Lord Pearson, who was a leader of UKIP, and he was the only mainstream politician in this country making any sound at all about Islam. Then when he left, which was very unfortunate, and Nigel Farage came back in, uh, the whole Islamic thing was shelved. So I thought, where do I go from here? I agree with most of what UKIP says, but I need to have something that addresses the Islamic question, hence my involvement now with British freedom. Um, so, okay, then, what exactly is it that makes British freedom a distinctive and different from the other parties? You mentioned Islam, uh, but what else is it that makes British freedom a different kind of party? Because that's what you're claiming it is. Well, it's a different party immediately because it talks about the Islamic question. But isn't it just that uh, all the reports of the British Freedom Party talk about it being a far-right extremist organisation. Listen, if um, you talk... Why, why would you if, want to, why would you want you to be involved about, with a far-right organisation? If you talk about Islam in this country today, you are going to be labelled far-right. This is exactly why yeah, someone this is like point, this, is, this is the point I'm making. If you want to be taken seriously as a politician, why are you going with this little far-right party well, I've just when you could be the mainstream party? I've just explained that to you. The mainstream party does not address the Islamic question. British freedom does, hence my involvement in it. It's really very simple. Okay, well let's move to another uh, issue which seems to be a, a preoccupation of British freedom, um, which is immigration. Mm -hmm. Now look, we have a, a multicultural society in Britain now. People pretty much get along okay. Uh, we've managed to absorb large numbers of immigrants without serious problems. And what is the issue? Why are you so obsessed with, with immigration? <coughs> well, I think, I think uh, I'm not sure that we have successfully absorbed large numbers. You know, we have huge numbers coming in. We all know that since 1997, we've had something like three or four million people coming in here. Now, we, you know, we, we, we don't even know if those are the right figures. It could be anything up to nine million, ten million for all we know. Oh, that's a ridiculous exaggeration, surely. Well... Do you know that for a fact? You know, we know that the, well, the official figures. The official figures tell us that there are uh, half a million coming in each year, um, as I understand it. And actually, the figure for net immigration is much smaller because many people are leaving. So we're talking uh, much and who more. Are, and who are leaving? Which people are leaving? Do well, you know I, which people are leaving? I don't know. Are they your traditional British people who are leaving, or are they uh, third world immigrants who've come in and decided to go home again? Because if you think that you've got 600,000 people came here last year, and they say net immigration is only 2.5 million, uh, sorry, two, uh, 250,000. Now you're looking at 350,000 plus people who've moved out. Now what you're looking at here is population replacement if those people are native Brits who've just said, listen, I've had enough of this so-called fantastically successful multicultural uh, regime. But why does We're it matter, why, why does it matter? if people, people want to leave, they're free to leave? Uh, if people want to come to this country and contribute, then they're free to do so. What, what's the issue here? I don't see the problem. Well, if people want to come to this country and contribute, that's all well and good. But we now know from the Equalities Commission that 75% of Muslim women are not working and 50% of Muslim men are not working. 
Now, that is not contributing to our society. If we've got British taxpayers leaving the country and we are replacing them with people who are a net drain on our economy and we are already, incidentally, bankrupt, then that is not good for the country. It but, might work, but, but, but it sure, might but work sure. for a number of years, but, but it is can't not expect, sustainable. You can't people to it's come. not sustainable in the long run. You can't expect people to come here and find work immediately. Whenever anybody moves to a different country, it takes them a while to adapt. Why do we need people to come here to find work in the first place? We've got two million people unemployed, I think, is the latest figure. Well, because diversity adds something to our country. Uh, you know, for a long time we were just this kind of monocultural, boring uh, kind of uh, country, and now we have a much more diverse and vibrant society than we've had before. Mm -hmm. um, surely this is a, a good thing, isn't it? To be diverse and vibrant. Have you been to any of our town centres recently and seen how diverse and vibrant they are? You know, you've got, uh, you've got people, I, I assume that you're probably left-wing, or, or, or at least liberal left. You've got people, uh, police, high-ranking police officers, who don't talk about wonderful diversity, they talk about nerve-jangling tensions in city centres around this country now. And this is what you would call diversity. What I would call it is, is low-level uh, cultural war being waged against the British people, the native British people. They don't like it, so they start responding. This is a tit-for-tat thing. And then the other side doesn't like it either, hence you get nerve-jangling situation. Coming back to this question of Islam, um, you're complaining uh, frequently about Muslims and about Islam, but specifically, what is it that you object to? I mean, what, what is the problem? You, you, you talk about Muslims being out of work. Okay, that's, that's a, an economic issue. Um, but your criticism is, of Islam seems to be much wider than that. Can you tell us a, a bit about what your objections are to having uh, Islam in Britain? Look, Islam is a completely different way of life to the traditional British way of life. It runs counter to everything that a liberal democracy stands for. For a start, Islam does not believe in democracy. It doesn't believe in man-made laws. It considers them to be some blasphemy against, uh, against Allah. Now, you cannot have that type of civilization that has never successfully coexisted with any other civilization before. All it's done previously, it defeated the Byzantine uh, civilization. It defeated the Persian civilization. It hasn't just taken out countries, it's taken out civilizations. For a thousand years, it was at war against the West. But if people come to live here, uh, whether they be Muslims or anything else, they will gradually adapt to our ways. It might take a generation or two. If you go to Tower Hamlets now, you'll see young women wearing Western clothes, using mobile <coughs> phones. They uh, enjoy a, a British-style education. You know, within a generation or two, these people will be completely integrated into British society. No, you're completely wrong. I think you'll find that when you look at the first generation Asian Muslims that came here in the 60s and in the 70s, they are nowhere near as radical as their grandchildren, uh, uh, grandchildren, maybe even great-grandchildren now. When they first came here, they did not have access to mosques that were being funded by hardline Wahhabist Saudi Arabian money. They, Saudi Arabia has spent 90,000 million petrodollars putting propaganda, hardline Wahhabist propaganda into the West. We've got 2,000 mosques in this country. We've got madrasas cropping up. One third of them are promoting extremist literature and extremist ideology. What, what evidence do you have of that? What evidence do we have of that? Yes. We've had, uh, we've had the policy exchange, uh, which I'm sure you haven't heard of, but the, uh, it's, a, it's a, a supposedly right-wing. I wouldn't call it right-wing, but it's a, it's, a, it's a think tank. Now, they did an investigation two or three years ago. They had a report out about it. I don't remember the name of the report, but you can find it on the Internet. Uh, it's called the Policy Exchange, one-third extremist literature. You've but you're, so you're talking about a small minority here. No, we're uh, not talking about okay, a small everybody, minority. Everybody accepts that there might be a problem with... Uh, you're quite, a, a, you're quite aware of the of fact. Matters. You're quite aware of the fact that 40, you know, a survey said 40% of Muslims in this country would like to see Sharia law adapted. 33% of Muslims at universities saying killing in the name of Islam is permissible. This is not a small minority. Are you 40, quite sure about for, this, Yes, please? I'm quite sure about that. 40% of, what have we got now, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, we don't really know 
because we haven't had any proper checks on people coming into this country. It is not a small number. They are becoming increasingly radicalised. They have a history, a thousand-year history, of wanting to take over, which is what they want to do, Western countries, and they succeeded, and they are now back. They don't have weapons, they don't have guns, they're not doing it this way. You know, Karadawi uh, actually came out and said, we, uh, we will do it by proselytizing and faith. Another one came out and said, we'll do it via the wombs of our women. This is what is happening now. It's the biggest single threat the West faces this century. And I would actually compare that threat as being similar to that of Nazism or communism oh, this in is the last country. This is ridiculous. You're comparing Islam, which is a faith, which many people... Islam uh, is not just a faith. Many people adhere to it peacefully. You're comparing that to Nazism. Many people do adhere to it peacefully. There were many Germans who adhered peacefully to being a normal German, but it didn't stop the rise of Nazism. A minority of Nazis took but Germany... If you to compare it to Nazism... A minority of communists took, took uh, the Soviet in Union... What ways is it Islam was comparable to Nazis? In what ways is Islam comparable to Nazism? Oh, well, you are. You, you, uh, you're joking, presumably. No, I'd like to hear it. Really? Well, their attitude to homosexuals, for example. Which is what? Nazis wanted to uh, exterminate homosexuals. Fundamentalist Islam wants to exterminate homosexuals. Their leader, Mr. Hitler, was, uh, was a, uh, a prophet, just about, who could not be criticised. Muhammad is a prophet that you can't criticise. Their attitude towards women, uh, the church, the school and the bedroom, ex second class status for women, exactly the same for Islam. Uh, world domination, install the caliphate, a thousand year, a thousand year Reich, uh, a thousand year caliphate. Look, you talk about it's, world domination, the average, exactly the average the Muslim citizen in this country, he wants a quiet life, he wants to get on with his life, find a job, raise his family, and uh, abide by the law, just like everybody else. The great majority of Muslims are moderate people who want to integrate. I don't see why you're making such a big issue of this. Do you actually know a great deal about Islam? Do you know much about the history of Islam? Are you taking on board what I just said to you, that 40% 40, uh, 40 of Muslims in Britain want to Sharia law? Does this not bother you at all? You talk about a small minority and peaceful people. And yes, of course they exist. But the problem with them, if you have 40% of, and I assume that, the, uh, that males will be more susceptible to this than women, and they will be young, and they will be the, uh, the potential to violence, we've had the 7-7 bombings here. You know, you look at something like, uh, like the Arab Spring going on now, you know, it's not just Muslims against uh, non-Muslims, it's, it, it, it's intercommunal uh, Islamic warfare, it's Shia against Sunni. It's All right, tribe let's, let's, move tribe. let's move on from Islam. Well, no, no, let's move on from Islam. There are other issues here that I want to discuss. Well, well, now, well, well no, can I, can I, I, you, I, I, can I before you. you finish, just ask you one very simple thing? Do you honestly consider that if 40% of millions want Sharia law in this country, that that to you is not a problem? Is that what you're saying to me? What I'm saying is that if people come to live here with different traditions, we should make some kind of accommodation to that. What's wrong with that? Because you cannot accommodate Islam. Islam does not want to accommodate. Islam wants to take over. So, are you saying that all those Muslims living here should renounce Islam? Is that what you're saying? I suppose I am, yes. But because that's, that's, because, that's because you cannot... You ca Listen, the only reason that I am involved in this is I genuinely think that within 20 years we are going to see full-scale civil war, like the breakup of Yugoslavia. That uh, Yugoslavia broke up along racial, religious, tribal fault lines. Now, these things have been happening for century after century. And for some reason, liberal left people in this country seem to think that you can put all of this stuff in, into, the, into some great big melting pot, and we are not going to have some sort of intercommunal violence. Of course we are. We're going to have civil war in this country. Mr. Weston, you're beginning to sound like Enoch Powell. What was wrong with Enoch Powell? Well, he, he, was he was a racist, a well-known racist. Enoch Powell predicted there would, be, there would be problems if you brought in... And let's not forget, when Enoch Powell was doing this, 
there were only something like 100,000 West Indians in this country at the time, and they were coming in in their thousands, not in their hundreds of Most thousands. of whom have integrated very successfully into British society. I would quite agree with you. I have no problem at all with this. But bear in mind that what Enoch Powell was saying back in the 50s was not what the problem would be at the present time back then, it's what the future was going to be. And we are looking at this future now. We have got problems all across Europe. We've got problems with Islam all across Europe. We've got violence with Islam all across Europe. This is happening. It's real. It's reality. I don't know if that dawns on, on, uh, on some well, people. Well, uh, what you're doing is painting a very depressing picture of future Britain. Uh, I, I would like to hear from you. You know, if you really believe that this is what Britain will be like in 50 years, if we continue on the pressure... Not in course. 50 years, not in 50 years, within 20 years, within one more generation. OK, so how is British freedom going to prevent this and actually present some kind of positive uh, vision of a future Britain? Well, for a start, what you have to do is close the immigration doors now. You know, we are not going to have another 600,000. If we were elected, we would not have another 600,000 next year and the year after that until eventually uh, we're just subsumed by this. What we would do is say, no more immigration, and then we will start looking at the mosques and the madrasas, and if we find that they are promoting extremist ideology, we'll close them down. We don't have a problem per se with Islam, but we do have a problem with fundamentalist Islam. So you're if seriously you talking about sending in squads of police into, into places of worship? Is that what you're saying? I don't consider them to be places of worship. A mosque is not just a place of worship. It is not like a church. We're not talking about a secular uh, religion here. Islam is a political and religious ideology, but it is also political. But nevertheless, you're talking about sending in squads of police into a place where people pray I mean, isn't that going to provoke the most massive reaction? If it provokes a reaction, it provokes a reaction. If they're selling extremist ideology and they're promoting extremist ideology, one thing that I can never understand with, uh, with liberals these days is they profess to care greatly about homosexual rights and women's rights, yet they are explicitly saying things in mosques and madrasas around this country today about harming homosexuals, about killing homosexuals, about making sure that women know their place, and yet the liberal left just let this go, because in your peculiar warped world that you lot live in these days, Islam trumps feminism, trumps homosexuality. I don't know why you've allowed this to happen. I, you know, I actually care about what happens to homosexuals in this country, presumably more than you do. Islam doesn't like it. If we have to go into mosques, it doesn't have to be with squads of, uh, of uh, jackbooted stormtroopers. We can send in undercover people. We can send in uh, uh, people when they are not actually praying. But we do need to know what they're doing in there. And if they are found to be uh, promoting extremism, they get closed down. So we're not saying you're not welcome here if you're a Muslim. What we're saying is you're not welcome here if you are against my country, my culture, my heritage, my tradition, my democracy, my liberal democracy, if you're against that, then that mosque will be closed down. Okay, moving on from Islam, one of the issues which seems to be uh, prominent in, in the um, British Freedom Manifesto uh, is the issue of free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Britain has always been the home of free speech. It, uh, that tradition continues. What exactly are your concerns? Does that tradition continue? Uh, people can say what they like in this country. It's no, they common. can't. No, they can't. If you, uh, if you criticize Islam and you cause offense uh, to even just one individual Muslim, you can then be tried under the new uh, Religious Hatred Act, which I think came in 2006, inciting religious hatred. Thou shalt not criticize Islam. Sharia law bans the uh, criticism of Islam. So we are now a Sharia-compliant country, along with many others. No, but we live under British law. We don't live under this Sharia law. People, British, people can criticise British, Islam. British law always allowed criticism. We are now being told, you know, it's being driven by the uh, organisation uh, of, of uh, the Islamic Conference, 
who are the biggest bloc vote in the UN, they're trying to stop criticism of Islam around the world and also here. Well, um, look, this has, is, well listen, um, this is why, what, has, what, what, has, what, has one single person ever been prosecuted for criticising Islam in Britain? Well, yes, they have. Darren, uh, uh, Darren Conway recently apparently had some pictures of, uh, of the EDL, I think, and uh, something to do with uh, Mohammed in, a, in the window of his house, and I think he's been banged up for six, uh, for six months. But if somebody's posting inflammatory material that could stir, stir up racial hatred, then... then well, that's, uh, that's exactly it, is he? Stirring up racial hatred, stirring up religious hatred. Now, where do you draw the line? What is valid criticism and what isn't? Because stirring up hatred is exactly what the law says. Now, that can be taken to mean that if you criticize a valid uh, uh, section of, of, of Islam, such as why, for example, is there this propensity for, uh, for rape cases in this country uh, to be so singularly related to Pakistani uh, gangs? Now. At the moment, I think we can still say that. Well, this is ridiculous. If you're talking about paedophilia, we've just had this big case with, with uh, Jimmy Savile and a possible ring of paedophiles in the BBC. They weren't Muslims. You know, you can't pin this on one particular community. No, you can't. I mean, quite frankly, uh, it, it doesn't surprise me at all that there's a large paedophile ring within the BBC. I'm very glad that you've admitted that. Uh, but uh, this is... This is something which, which comes from, uh, from the Islamic ideology itself, that women are second-class status uh, compared, to, uh, compared to men, and non-Muslims are second-class compared to Muslims. Now, there is a great deal of this thought process, that, uh, thought process that goes behind the grooming and the rape of young English girls. Yes, but you're demonising a whole community, and the fact is these crimes are, you not, see, there you these go crime, these there, crimes are not specific there you to go, a particular community. There you go again, demonising, stirring up hatred. You know, we're not allowed to say these things. These things are a fact. These things have been going on in this country. What for I'm a saying is, you're targeting you one, to... one, one community when they're not the only community guilty of these crimes. Really? What's the other community? Well, there are native British people who are paedophiles. There are. Yes, yes, there are. There are. And there are individuals, and I believe there are also groups. But this uh, uh, Islamic side that is going on in the northern towns and cities in this country today is linked explicitly to the ideology of Islam because of the second-class status of non-Muslim uh, people and the second-class status of women. Now, you can't ignore that. I know that you're going to try to ignore I'm that. trying to talk about free speech and you keep bringing the conversation back to Islam. Well, I'm not bringing it back to Islam. I just, uh, I just said. Uh, I was trying to talk about the issue of free speech. Listen, Tell me about are, free speech. We, we are still allowed in this country to criticise toffs. We're allowed to criticise all sorts of people. We're allowed to have a go at uh, at, uh, at the Christians. We're allowed to have piss Christ, for example. You know, we can do all of these things. What we can't do is criticise Islam. Okay. Now this is Sharia law in operation. We are now a Sharia compliant country. You put some, you know, you put some cartoons out of Muhammad. You suddenly got the whole bloody world in uh, in. Uh, in can, in we a free speech? can we get back to free speech? Well, free speech Please. is free speech is exactly. If you if you think as I think that we face a huge and growing problem with fundamentalist Islam in this country, and you take away our free speech, our right to free speech, our right to free assembly, in order to try to, to deal with this before it becomes uh, out of, uh, before it gets out of hand, then you're taking away the only reasonable civilized way that we can deal with it. Because if you stop the valid criticism of Islam and you drive it underground and Islam continues in the same vein that it's behaving in at the moment, you will get to a level within a few years time of physical violence of civil war, which is why free speech is so important and which is why we should say no to the United Nations, no to the OIC. We need to be able to talk about this and bring it up and discuss it. Okay, well if, if, if as you say free speech is under threat, and I, I'm not convinced of it, but if it is, what is your party going to do about it? We would simply try to introduce something like uh, uh, the First Amendment within uh, uh, America. 
free speech is free speech unless you're shouting fire in a crowded theatre. Right. Are you claiming that America has greater free speech than we do in Britain? I, I certainly am, yes. Okay, thank you. Moving on. Uh, there's a gentleman called Dr. Sean Gann. I believe he's the uh, director of the um, Libertarian Alliance or Libertarian Organization in Britain. He spoke recently, uh, I think it was a, a meeting of the traditional Britain group. He spoke recently about the ruling class of Britain acting against the interests of British people. He spoke about uh, the ruling class being the enemy of the British people, about the need for a revolution, about dismantling British institutions, about smashing the BBC. I mean, this is fairly extreme language from somebody who's supposedly a conservative. And what do you make of it? Well, I think uh, this is a typical example that if you have a long drawn out 50 year left wing revolution that we've had in this country, you are eventually going to uh, start to upset normal middle of the road conservative people who are saying, listen, we've had enough of this. You say uh, smashing the BBC, you know, I'm, I don't think we should smash the BBC, but I do think that uh, under their, uh, under their uh, 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 impartiality rulings, we should force them to be impartial, because right now they're not impartial. And what evidence do you have for that? What evidence do I have of the BBC not being impartial? Yes. Well, I'll take you back to the Islamic question again, because, because this is something that's very dear to their hearts. They are very pro-Palestinian, they're very anti-Israel. But on the BBC bite-sized revision that's being put out into the unformed minds of young children. They actually, uh, you can look it up on the website, BBC Bite Size GCSE Revision, Religious Studies, Islam, Christianity. This is a, an educational? It's an educational tool put out by the BBC that talks about oppression, it talks about uh, victimology, it talks about uh, the, uh, the power elite, and then it tells you that Christianity is a sexist, racist, uh, enslaving, murdering religion, whilst Islam is a female-friendly, wonderful, tolerant. Now this is the sort of thing that is not impartial. And they do this to a lesser degree, this is a, this is a very uh, overt degree, but this is symptomatic of the BBC. They are always, they are taking the left-wing sort of viewpoint. Well, we often hear complaints about bias in the BBC, and these complaints, they come from the left, who complain about right-wing bias, they come from the right, who complain about left-wing bias. I mean, the very fact that they're receiving complaints from both sides, they, doesn't that tell you that they've, they've reached a balance somehow? They receive complaints from the left. What can they possibly receive complaints of, from the left about? I have no idea if about, that's true About right-wing bias in the BBC. Well, I don't think I've ever seen any right-wing bias in the BBC. So you're, or, cla are you, are you, you're claiming that the BBC has been taken over by left-wing people? Absolutely, yes. And not just the BBC, the educational service has been taken over, the uh, vast sways of the civil service have been taken over, the upper echelons of the police force have been taken You're over. You're beginning to sound the a little media paranoid, has been Mr. Taken over. You're starting to sound a little paranoid. Ah, well, you know, I mean, they always say that uh, conspiracy theories and paranoia, you know, sometimes they're true. And this... But this is precisely the reason why true. the British people would never follow a far-right organisation like yours, because you come out with these bizarre conspiracy theories. Well, first of all, explain what you mean by far right, and having done that, if you can, well, like your explain, to me why it's a, explain to me why it's a conspiracy. The English Defence League, British Freedom, they're, they're both far right organisations. Why is British Freedom a far right organisation? Do you, I mean, do you consider calling for a First Amendment on free speech something to be far right? Is that what you're saying to me? No, but your, your extremist opinions would never appeal to the great My British extremist party. opinions. You find the idea of stopping mass immigration an extremist opinion. You find the idea of stopping uh, mosques talking about killing homosexuals and putting women into a second class status extremist. I think you'll find the only extremist here is you. I'm not extremist. I'm a traditional middle of the road conservative Britain. And I would like this country to be 
traditional conservative. Uh, traditional group. middle of the road conservative, but you've just teamed up with the English Defence League, haven't you? The English Defence League. I mean, the, 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 these are people who who march on the streets, cause trouble, smash things up. Uh, they're a right-wing organisation, and you're claiming to be middle of the road conservative. I, well, I wouldn't say they were a right-wing organisation. I. No doubt you normally uh, put the word conservative and right-wing together. I don't suppose there are many natural conservatives within the English Defence League. Most of them will be traditional Labour uh, voters. But Labour has effe uh, effectively and essentially betrayed the white working class of this country. When you talk about extremism, I think it is an extreme thing to do to bring in people from the third world with a completely different set of cultural values and put them down within white working class areas and expect the white working class to then actually live cheek by jowl with them because it's not happening. And the reason that the English Defence League exists is because the white working class of this country were betrayed between 1997 and 2010 by the Labour Party, who actually came out, Andrew Neither came out and said, we deliberately brought all these people in to, to rub the noses of the right wing in diversity and to change the cultural makeup of this country. Now, for people like that, high-ranking Labour officials... They don't have to live with what they've done because they live in Hampstead and Islington and they send their children to expensive schools. They have betrayed the working class of this country, hence the rise of the English Defence League. And when you talk about they go out rioting, I've been on some of these things. Well, they're, just, they're, they're a racist organisation, admit it, Mr Weston. They're just a bunch of racist thugs. No, they're not. I presume you've read their... Uh, their, their uh, Ideology. Where no, but I've seen I've seen the news reports of trouble caused by the English Defence League. Really on the BBC? Well, on many news channels. Really? I assume on the BBC because the only time they ever put anything out about the EDO on the main news channels is when there is trouble. If you have an event that goes off with no trouble, it doesn't make the news. And the only trouble comes from Unite Against Fascism and the hard left, the communist left, the ones up there waving little hammers and sickles and socialist worker uh, signs around. They're the ones that cause the trouble, and that is never reported, which is why I talk about the fact that institutions like the BBC have been taken over. They only report it when the news is what they want to report. When speaking, the EDL, speaking, speaking of the EDL... Just this past week, uh, a number of members of the EDL have been arrested, mm. including one of their leaders, uh, Mr Tommy Robinson, and including also your party vice chairman, who's also a co-founder of the English Defence League, Mr Kevin Carroll. That's I, mean, right. I understand that you too have been involved in this, you've been embroiled in this, getting yourself arrested at Wormwood Scrubs Prison this week. Uh, if you're this respectable conservative organisation, what are you do? What are you doing, hanging around with people who are getting arrested, getting yourself arrested? What on earth is going on here? Well, this uh, th th this is exactly why uh, Libertarian Alliance uh, members like Sean Gabb, for example, talk about the need for a counter revolution in this country, because they were arrested driving towards uh, a planned demonstration. They weren't doing anything. Uh, this is how frightening this country has become now. Finally, Mr Weston, where do you see yourself in five years' time, you and your party? Well, it's not a question of five years' time. We want to make uh, an impact on the 2015 election. Uh, five years uh, from now is only going to be 2016, 2017. We're looking at really at 2020. An impact in the 2015 election and the potential of winning the 2020 general election. But given the first-past-the-post system we have in Britain, isn't it going to be very difficult for a small party like yours to break into the mainstream? If we remain a small party, it will be impossible. But I think what we are saying uh, resonates with the British public, and I think we could have overwhelming support by 2020. If you found yourselves in a situation after a general election of having a small number of MPs, would you be willing to enter into a coalition with the main parties? Not with all the main parties, no. We would enter into a coalition with the Conservatives. Uh, we consider the Labour Party to have betrayed their own country and their own people, so certainly not the Labour Party, clearly not the Lib Dems who are going to be running a mile from us, but the Conservatives, yes. 
Paul Weston, thank you very much. Thank you.